On accueille donc Ibrahim Gedeon. Et pour les questions, c'est sur Slido. Bonjour et merci. Thank you very much. Uh, I was planning to speak in French. But I feel maybe I should communicate first and I'll answer in French. So uh, you were talking about 6G. We really have no imagination, do we? 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. So, so it sounds like there's a bit of a mental handicap on anything to do with uh, marketing, right? So, uh, so, so when, when they asked me to give a little bit of a talk about what we're doing with quantum, as usual, uh, engineers, what is the first thing they do? They, they look at all the stuff they know about the topic, right? And then we want to complicate it so much to show you how smart we are. Like, oh my God, I can tell them about qubits and how we cool them, and then none of you guys care, correct? <laughs> so I decided to take a bit of a different approach in terms of what quantum means to potentially a service provider like TELUS, similar to what you talked about in terms of the uh, services we would do, uh, but more importantly, why we would care about something and where would we invest, right? Like it's not just about press releases because we seem to get one a day on how innovative Canadians are. And I was chatting outside with our colleagues from Numana. Most of the things I buy are from vendors outside Canada, which is unfortunate, right? So let's see if we can make a change, at least on the quantum side with that. So um, you guys do know that it, it's, we're like 40 years old on this, right? I can't see much, but I mean, like, you, you don't know it's 40 years old, right? Like, it's not that new. It's very sexy, but it's not new, right? Like, we know that. And it took 20 years to make the first quantum computer, right? And then Canada had the vision with Mike Lazarus to say, oh, maybe we should start a quantum institute. That was in 2002. And now we're looking at doing a test bed, among other things. So if you are... Tell us. Could be another telco. I think we're a bit better than all of them, of course. But uh, for everybody there who's a client of ours, thank you. For the rest, I'm sorry you can't experience the fantastic service, but it's okay. It's good for competition. Uh, the reason I put this chart is not to show you I can Google something, but it's a very simple answer. You've noticed that it, every 20 years we have something. Now is the next 20 years. So one, are you not surprised that it took a while to get us where we are? Like usually if something takes 20 years, the next big disruption is 15 or 10, then the one after it is 10. But here it seems we're doing an increment of 20. So the reason I put this up to say is, even if we're wrong and it's not accelerating, the time is now to do something about this, right? So this is the right time to see what we can do with quantum since the 80s. Is this the next big thing to be done? And I'll talk a bit about the applications. This chart is something that, as engineers, we came up with. Uh, you know, we're all happy in our devices, right? Like, how much bandwidth do we all get? How much bandwidth do you guys get? 300 meg, 400 meg? Like, with 5G, you'll be getting a gig or two gigs. Great. How much do you have at home? Like, we don't provide home services within the Montreal area, but if you live in Alberta and you're welcome to come over, uh, it's not that cold. We have very warm hearts. But you get anywhere from a gig to 10, depending on the, what you're trying to do. May I ask you one small question? So when you get attacked today as an infrastructure, these people don't forget, when we have so much bandwidth, you're getting attacked with, with a gig or 10 gigabits per second. So the bigger the pipe, the more dangerous the threat. So, so that's why I have it here. And I need to take a bit of a sidetrack comment. I'm a bit disappointed with all the quantum professionals because we tried for the longest time to talk about the opportunity of faster compute, correct? You can do this much faster. You, you can help with DNA. You can help with all that scientific stuff. We could get the coronavirus within three days instead of three months. But we as humans don't care if we don't see where the money's being made. So we're finding everybody loves quantum now because, oh my God, if I get hacked, 
how am I quantum safe? So we're trying the angle of the threats, which is working. So, but for us, there's a real reality when you have so much bandwidth and you are connected globally, then being hacked makes it more like 10x worth worse or 100x worse. So, so that's one critical. The infrastructure needs to be protected. You need the right algorithms, and you guys know how serious that is. Uh, more so for the reliability and the redundancy. So we were chatting outside about how undigital we are. Did you remember COVID? Like, we still are in COVID, right? But it's, we're kind of coming out, correct? I live in Alberta, where our premier, Donald Trump, is happy that COVID doesn't exist. So it was good for me. Like, I would phone my parents here, and they'd say, oh, my god. We're locked down, but it's only six weeks this time. And I'd feel guilty because I'd be munching on my chicken wings and having my beer at the restaurant. So, uh, but did you not notice that everything was call a phone number? Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is now that we're not calling a phone number and we're digital, do you not want to be protected at multiple levels? So it's not just being hacked, it's the fact when you're hacked and how you're hacked, it's deadly. Unless you have protection towards what would be the ultimate in terms of compute and the ability to keep trying things. So we need to be much smarter about it. So we'll have massive compute available. You have massive bandwidth available. And you're somewhere where you can't see it, which is the cloud. Imagine if those things were commandeered. Do you think we need quantum technology, among other things, to put some discipline and governance and protect us? I think yes. So does any debate that it's much faster? Because I realize I over-talked on the last chart. I get so passionate about why the hell we should care that I, uh, even though there's a huge sexy clock that says 1301. No, but I mean, uh, what I wanted to, I don't want to insult the intelligence of the people that actually are working in quantum. Is there a debate on cost? of resources, yes, it's still not viable. Uh, if you look at what we're doing in terms of being able to solve, it, it, is, it is not an order of magnitude better. And the reason I have this, just for Shor's algorithm, is to look at the, you're talking about trillions of years and seconds. So it's not like it's 10x, it's something we can't fathom. So think of everything we're trying to do, uh, on-demand traffic analysis, uh, flight controls, how smart your car is. These are all applications we don't think of. We just think of banking, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And we think of how fast we can solve things. But think about all these things in your everyday life. Things like as simple as MRIs will be like five, 10 minutes long, right? You don't need to get that analysis. How, who's had an MRI lately? Did you enjoy that 30 minutes of shit going in your ears? And then they give you, would you like classical music so you can hear the noise while you're listening to classical music? I didn't quite understand that. But anyway, so, so I put that up so you can understand what it is. What are the use cases we have? Uh, so this is a viable business. So Telus made an investment in a small company in Australia. Uh, quantum key exchange, right? So we all exchange keys. We have entitlements, passwords. Where's Francois in here? But uh, well, he's one of three Francois that I met today. But, if you look at the work Dayak's doing and Quebec's taking a massive charge, nationally and globally, I hope, on, on identity, uh, we all have digital IDs. We all need keys to unlock things. So that is a viable business today. It doesn't need our help. You'll see a theme to what I'm trying to do. Uh, providing keys, the second point is providing keys to, for encryption, decryption. That's also happening today. A lot of the institution, if you want the coolest key, would be a quantum key or a quantum key exchange. I'm here to talk about the house. If you have the coolest door in the build in the neighborhood, yet your house is not that stable, that's not so good, right? Like it's kind of good. You have the best door in the neighborhood, but you have lousy windows. You have no control. <laughs> So it's a holistic hygiene posture. And when we think of quantum, we can't just think of one piece. Uh, same with encryption and decryption. And the last one, which I think area that we think is very interesting and very critical, and the Europeans actually have a bit of a lead 
on the world uh, is at a physical level how to use quantum computing to protect infrastructure. Because that is the best way to make sure that we don't compromise what we've got. And then there's a lot of really great examples coming out of Europe. And one thing they've done is they've done a lot of good funding. So uh, for a lot of these programs, out of universities, take them as products. But I guess the operators in Europe are just as short-sighted as the operators in Canada, including ourselves, that nobody sees an application for it. I tend to like it as an engineer, but being able to uh, leverage quantum to protect infrastructure is a much better way, or the whole notion of quantum safe. So, so uh, in the Waterloo Corridor, to be fair, uh, the Quantum Institute has done a brilliant job getting a bunch of startups going. Uh, the question is, are we too early? It goes back to my chart. 1980, 1998, 18 years. 2023. I don't know about you, but 23 years looks like it's ripe, right? A lot of excitement here in this room that's talking about quantum, so I'm, I'm glad. Maybe I can come back next year and we can talk about 2024, what we're going to do for quantum. Uh, I think this is the right time. <laughs> I think the most difficult problem is the one that researchers love to tackle, which is on the right. I think being able to, to do quantum safe or quantum secure is the low-hanging fruit. So why are we, uh, I don't know when the public releases, I apologize, but why are we supporting this? So when I started writing this, somebody says, oh, well, you know, we must do it. We must have something in Canada. The Europeans have it, right? Europe's got a quantum test, but don't you think we should have our own? I need one too, right? I mean, like, I walked around, I said, oh, my God, I can't let the Europeans buy a, buy a quantum test bed. So I put this up to show you that is not why TELUS is enthusiastic and would love to be part of what Humana is doing. It's not because the Europeans got a quantum test bed. I'm very happy for them. I think it's wonderful. What will that do for Canadian intellect? I mean, like, would it make us richer people? Like, will we have startups in Canada that will be very successful because the Europeans have got a friggin' test bed? I mean, like, honestly, really, like, why am I, why are we happy? But what is it we're doing that be a bit different? You're not, and I saw the gentleman from Italy that was like really excellent talk about what they're talking, what they mentioned. Uh, but I would like, I don't know, I'm famous for not staying focused on the topic. Let me stay focused on the topic, and then we'll talk a bit about the Japanese. So, the reason we're supporting this testbed is because our slant is a holistic slant. So, if you look at what's being done and proposed, it is being proposed as an end-to-end -end ecosystem from researchers to people who consume and in the end, that sustainable intellectual wealth will stay here, which is why we're interested. Not just to buy from someone, right? Like it, if it start, gets startups going and sparks them up, that's the interesting part of what I hope we will be doing with the Quebec testbed that's a bit different than the European testbed. So we'll still need that foundational research, but I don't think there's a role for a TELUS to support foundational research where the only metric is to publish papers. I think we have a responsibility to work on something which would generate sustainable wealth for the country, and whoever is the operator working to support this will eventually make more money than the others, which I love doing. So that is why we're really excited about what's happening here, and the fact that the, we call it the Quebec quantum test fund, but actually it's industry coming together to manifest use cases. And I want to go back one chart. It is not about stuff that exists, at least not our interest point of view, right? It's about looking at a digital society and what it means to these aspects and where that quantum test bed. That's why we're excited about this. Um, I had to put a bit of a dig, and somebody says, why do you want this chart up? It's a TELUS advertisement. It's not a TELUS advertisement. 
so I, I worked for Bell Northern Research for many years of my life. And I was a, I'm a proud Canadian engineer, and I happen to be the CTO of Telus. But I was in a company working in an area where I was number one in the world. I don't want you. I think we have brilliant friggin' scientists. I don't, like, honestly, do I believe more in you than you believe in yourself? Like, this is killing me. The reason this chart's up is how can we be part of the journey not to recreate Nortel? It was great, it screwed up, it went bankrupt, but there can be many other institutions that actually we can rally around. And that is why what we're trying to do in the era of quantum is supporting the test bed in Quebec to find out the applications that we could do that would eventually spark things. So, so I want to now talk about the Japanese. I promise you I'm going to get back to the Japanese, right? So and let me ask you two questions. What is the most important thing for a startup? For any idea, what is the most important thing? Mm, who said clients? Yeah. Yes, so clients are the most important thing. So if you tell, you go to any venture capitalist and say, tell us is my client, what is that worth to your evaluation and to how much money they would lend you? That's the role we want to play as part of the ecosystem. But it has to be part of a larger ecosystem. So, so all I'm saying is, this is why I think what we're gonna do is gonna be very different, not just mean to, and yes, and I love people with PhDs. Those are the guys that we're gonna hijack us so we can publish cooler papers. Couldn't give a shit about that. I think it has a role, it's fantastic. Tell us does not have to be involved. So. The reason we're involved is it's the end-to-end -end ecosystem, and I'm going to run out of time. If you excuse, I will try in two minutes. Uh, so when you think of Japan, uh, you think maybe of TVs, right? Definitely cars, right? They did a brilliant job. I mean, they came, so I'll date myself. Like, I bought a Honda Civic because it was so freaking cheap. And it had a stereo that was inbuilt. So if you bought a North American car in the 80s, the stereo was an option. So if you were trying to be a cool engineer, and I realize engineers are not cool, so I don't want to insult my colleagues. You want, like, especially if you wanted to impress whoever you, the other sex means to you, gender-wise, you really need a stereo. And I don't know about you guys, but 500 bucks is 500 bucks. So when Honda came up with stereo inbuilt, I said, oh my God, that's my car. So they were cheap, they had all the bells and whistles, then they became great cars. Do you agree or not? With brands like Lexus, they start supporting F1. There's the Honda team here, right? Like so, Japan was the same. Sony was the lead in TVs, right? And then as you know, they were overtaken by Samsung and LG. So Korea took the number one spot. So the reason I mentioned the Japanese is they disappeared in the telecom space in Japan. They put a plan, 10 years, not like, that's why our investment is gotta be long-term together as a community, not just tell us cut a check. They put a 10-year plan. The new, when, when you talked about 6G, so the new standard for how we're gonna fulfill wireless networks is called Open RAN, Open Radio Access Network. I don't wanna impress you that I'm a geek. We've established I'm a geek. Look at the glasses, look at the sweat. Guess who the global leader of radios in Oran is? Japan. So my fellow technologists and economists and people working in this area, I don't know why not us. <laughs> We've done it so many times before, and that's why I am pleased to be here and share with you that as long as we are got the right use cases, as long as we believe we can do it and we have the right partners where we may need some more, I'd love to have the next friggin' Yahoo or Google or Amazon out of Montreal. Not just so I can come back and see my mother more often, <laughs> but because I think we can do it. So thank you for that.
vous avez des questions, et il, y en a, il y en a juste une en ce moment, fait on va avoir du temps. Si il n'y a pas de questions, je ne suis pas insulté. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have more water. <laughs> What is the current reliability of quantum computers and how will that predictably increase over time? Thank you. So uh, it, it's on two levels. Uh, one is the actual reliability, as you know, due to heat and a bunch of number of areas. And the other one, it's not the computational reliability, it's the reliability of being able to interpret. So uh, I think there's a cost piece that doesn't seem to be com coming down fast enough to enable. So, so if you look at it, and uh, so we, we, we don't predict till 2025, uh, not for us to have it in our home, but to be able to look at the cost equation. Uh, and The heat is related to how many qubits you have. So, so one of the challenges is it's become more of an ego and more of a national ego, like it's the Chinese versus the Americans. So, so when we're looking at quantum computers per se on that aspect, uh, we, we think something around 2025 we'll start seeing an emergence whereby it'll be put to use on the industrial scale versus just what's happening now in terms of researchers and clandestine operations. You say they were two most important things for startup. What was the, sig the second? <laughs> She's reminding me of my CEO. <laughs> He's a brilliant man, but you can never mention anything to him. He never forgets it. <laughs> no, so George. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I said the most important, two very important things. One is clients. And the other one I think somebody else mentioned is the right team to deliver. Mm. Uh, because the right team It's not just the technologists and the engineers around, but it's people who actually have linkage with that customer so they can grow the roadmap. Uh, and if you notice, I never mentioned money once. Like, it's really important, but if you have those two things, you have the right team, and you have a client, money's there. Like, the first thing a venture capitalist does They talk about the space, and then they talk about the management team. So, so like if I look at our investments as Telus, if I'm buying your company, the first thing I do is I have your profile, your team's profile, and then I say, okay, well, and then based on your rating, that actually pushes the valuation of the company up. But customer is still very important. Yeah, of course. Do you think we could synergize quantum computing and all the ML experts in Quebec? I left Quebec 17 years ago, <laughs> so I have no clue. <laughs> but, but, but I think, judging from the way we have expertise spread out the country, the answer is no. I think it's much easier to try to get the people you want and get the ecosystem. Because we're human, right? Like, we don't all want to do what everybody else does, right? I know about myself. Like, I mean, you can disagree with me, but we're not cheap, and that's be the issue. Unless the government is willing to print out money, which is a different case. Hmm. The tech industry in the U.S. is now laying off because they hired too many too soon last year. What do you think will happen in Quebec and Canada? Uh, just speaking about tech in general, uh, like we lost most of our engineers or most of our technologists are going to U.S. based companies that are opening in Canada. So one thing about COVID is you can work anywhere. Uh, like we have people working in Ireland for BMO. You, I don't know if you guys know that, but like that's part of the new practice. So I haven't seen an issue with hiring too fast. I think we can't find the right skill set is more like it. So I, we, don't, we haven't seen that at all. And I think at least on technology in Quebec and the rest of Canada, uh, people love our educational system and you have a 20 to 30% discount on the US dollar. And we have inbuilt Medicare, so the company doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, this is a heaven for hiring technology. So if you have siblings, partners, kids in the space, I'd encourage them to continue in it. Uh, I think it's going to become more difficult for Canadian enterprise to hire Canadian, top Canadian talent. And, and 
we cannot compete with the U.S. prices because they make their money out of the U.S. So I don't know if you're seeing it or not, but if you had a private, there was a CIO council report that to tell us as part of that, that talks a lot about uh, there's a 30 to 50 percent markup. So so which is something that we can't afford. So we have to be selective and find out alternate ways to keep growing our talent pool. Okay. How do you see the role of quantum in future networks such as 6G? Ah, brilliant. You know, you waited till the kind of last question to get me the one that I really love so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we, we envision there's going to be a fundamental, so 6G, uh, do you guys know what 6G is, at least now what the geeks think it is? Like, do you have an idea or shall I explain? May I uh, take two milliseconds to tell you what 6G is? Okay, so now, uh, you know, you work on your spectrum, so we all have 5G phones. Well, you have great 5G issue, tell us, how's that for marketing? But uh, uh, the 6G phones, so you use frequencies that are uh, up to what we call mid-band, which is six, six gigahertz. Uh, Canada is one of the last countries in the world to auction the spectrum of what they call millimeter waves, which goes up to 100 gigahertz. So 6G is about opening it up to what they call terahertz, so 300 gigahertz plus. You really shouldn't care, but what it is as a user, <laughs> it would do two things. Uh, you would be able to get bandwidth speeds of up to 10 gig or 20 gig, you might not care. Uh, but for now, that's the envisioned part, uh, along with, so you think of the highway between uh, Montreal and Quebec, right, to, to relate. Or actually, I spent so many years of my life living in Ottawa, so it's one of the most boring drives is Ottawa-Montreal. I don't know if you agree or not, but I think it's a very boring drive. Straight line, you could kill yourself and still nobody would know because it's like the car is going. Uh, if you look at that road, have you ever envisioned brilliant coverage? And please work with me. So who's got a Tesla today? <laughs> who's got a, who bought a car in the last two years? Okay, so, 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 so the reason I mention this, uh, car manufacturers hate each other. So they all want to build the best sensors so I can find out how many idiots there are around me when I'm driving to protect my car. Because, you know, I'm Audi and BMW, oh, screw them, what do they know? And then the American says, we're going to build a much better system. So 6G, imagine this. You're going to have antennas on the sides of the streets. And we have a couple of trials, we can talk about them. But you'll have a couple of trials. You have a couple of antennas painted on the street. And you're able to communicate with the network, thus my car can talk to your car. So instead of me thinking you're stupid and spending $10,000 on sensors, which they charge you for as a consumer, we're actually more aware. So it's about things like what proper vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication uh, or D2D, device-to-device. -device. Now think about why quantum is important. If quantum is not inbuilt as part of the 6G infrastructure at the application layer, would you like your car to drive itself? No. So I gave a keynote on 5G like four years ago. And the CEO of AT&T was just before me. He says, 5G is so great. And then the flash thing was when you went like this, your phone said 5G, it was AT&T. So I didn't know he was going to say that because I was right after him. It was very embarrassing. Because I said, who gives a shit about the logo on the phone and what it says, which G it says. But I didn't notice. I didn't pay attention to what he was saying. So, so he gave me shit. He was an old friend. Uh, but the reason I mention it is they were talking about people performing surgeries on you. Like, I would love to try everything technical. I have a sous vide. Like, who ever thought of boiling friggin' meat that would taste good? I did that. The, the two of us. Me and the young lady up front. So I'll try everything, but there's no friggin' way. Somebody, 10,000 kilometers, is going to do any kind of surgery on me. Maybe they can do an inspection if I got a rash or something from far away. So 6G is about to make it more close. Capture not your digital you, but capture your virtual you and then transport it. So a bit more bandwidth, a bit smarter bandwidth, and affordable. So the 
all the telcos are fighting to do 6G work, we're monitoring. We're looking at 2030 for something meaningful. I think you mentioned that. Uh, there is a 6G positioning paper that will come out next year for those interested. It's part of the next generation mobile networks uh, conference that we'll talk about it. Cool. I'm Just thank in you. time. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.